80% of First Nations communities face risks related to wildfires, 80%. Tonight, the Liberal government announces their plans for the upcoming challenges of the 2024 wildfire season. Our intention all along is that we represent citizens of the Métis Nation of Alberta. The continued push toward Métis self-governance in Alberta. It broke my heart and I wanted to like get angry and upset. And Aniska, mother and son, speak about an upsetting incident at a local restaurant in BC. Good evening, I'm Savannah Kelly. Welcome to ABTN National News. In Manitoba, Lake St. Martin Chief Chris Travers has been charged with a number of sex offenses involving a child. Sav Jones has more and a warning to viewers the following information may be disturbing. Lake St. Martin Chief Chris Travers has been charged with sexual assault, sexual interference, and possessing and making child pornography. The alleged offenses took place in December of last year. Winnipeg police arrested Travers on February 1st. He was later released. Police say the alleged victim is an elementary school-aged child. Travers has been chief since July of 2022 after serving on council for many years. Last month, a group of elders gave him a letter demanding his resignation. Lake St. Martin is a member of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, as well as the Southern Chiefs organization. Both groups say they don't comment on criminal matters involving chiefs. Last week, Chief Travers asked for an interview with APTN to talk about issues in his First Nation. He mentioned allegations, but wouldn't say what they were. He did say he reached out to the AMC for help. I was told I'm on my own. And, and what, I, what, I, what, I said, what I said to AMC was, there, there, there's no, there's no, there's nothing in place for, for, for men in the, in the, in the society that, that are wrongly, wrongly accused of anything. And, and uh, shut the door, the door was shut on me. None of the charges against Chief Travers have been proven in court. His next appearance is July 3rd. Sav Jones, APTN National News, Winnipeg. 2023 was one of the worst wildfire seasons on record in Canada. With this in mind, the Trudeau government announced its plans for the upcoming fire season in Ottawa on Wednesday. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. At the press conference, Minister of Emergency Preparedness Harjit Sajjan says the government is bracing for another challenging wildfire season. We know that there are several uh, concerning trends. Southern Alberta, British Columbia and Southern Ontario are facing extreme drought conditions and we are expecting above normal temperatures all across the country, which, will, which is actually leading to uh, early snow melts. All these elements create conditions for a wildfire season like the last. Last year, fires raged from coast to coast, leading to the evacuations of First Nations communities in British Columbia, Alberta, and the Northwest Territories. As Minister of Indigenous Services Patty Hyde points out, Many First Nations communities are particularly vulnerable to wildfires. 80% of First Nations communities face risks related to wildfires, 80%. The colonial process of moving Indigenous peoples to remote lands through relocation and dislocation means that many communities are in extremely isolated areas. This is why the government is taking extra steps to prepare for this wildfire season. This includes $166 million in the upcoming budget to help First Nations plan, prepare, and respond to wildfires. IDU also says the government is advancing payments to First Nations communities so they are not left scrambling for compensation after incurring firefighting costs. Well, these kinds of things for First Nations that have the capacity to pay up front are irritants, but there are many First Nations that just don't have that fiscal capacity to be able to uh, rent equipment or organize a volunteer crew or, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, rapid evacuations if necessary. Ottawa is also seeking input from First Nations on best practices in combating wildfires through an Indigenous Emergency Management Working Group that met for the first time earlier this year. So what we're doing right now is to making sure that not only that the that there's progress, but they're actually part of that, that conversation and working with the leadership of the Indigenous um, uh, groups across the country, um, having regular meetings to making sure, just as we would do with any provincial territorial meeting, is how are we preparing, what, are the, what is the prevention, how are we doing the recovery. Government officials say because of climate change, you can expect to see more severe wildfire seasons for years to come. 
Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. On March 28th, a federal judge ruled that the Métis Nation of Alberta, now known as the Otapamisoak Métis Government of the Métis Nation within Alberta, needs to change the definition of the words Métis Nation within Alberta in their self-government implementation agreement after two Métis organizations sued. APTN's Chris Stewart has more. In 2023, the Métis Nation of Alberta signed the Métis Nation Within Alberta Recognition and Self-Government Implementation Agreement with the Federal Crown Indigenous Relations. The agreement says the Métis Nation of Alberta, now called the Otipim Simwek, Métis Government of the Métis Nation Within Alberta, has the right to self-govern. But two other groups, the Métis Settlements General Council and the Fort Mackay Métis Nation, filed suit against the agreement. They alleged that the words Métis Nation Within Alberta would include them in this agreement, giving the MNA the ability to represent them in negotiations. On March 28th, a federal justice agreed, saying that the Crown breached its duty to consult all parties. He ordered the agreement to remain in place, but sent it back to the Crown to review. Métis Nation within Alberta must be reworded to include only members of the MNA. Dave Lamouche is the president of the Métis Settlements General Council. We were very pleased with um, Justice uh, Drummond that made the decision uh, that uh, validates and reaffirms what the Métis Settlements General Council has always asserted, that we represent our members and our communities, and we have been uh, for many years. We are the only land-based Métis in Canada, and we will continue to do so. Uh, what we've released he says so there has been communication with the OTP Simwak Métis government. We reached out to Andrea very early on after she got elected and uh, we had a pretty good meeting and uh, we, we, we tried to build on that uh, relationship and uh, we'll continue to hopefully reach out and uh, say, I mean, see where, where our common interests are and continue to build that relationship. OTP Simwak Métis President Andrea Sandmeyer says her group can make changes to ensure only its members are included in the agreement. It's actually only one chapter that is um, in question, so th that will go back to Canada, and all it is is that they uh, want us to look at changing the wording around um, what, who, who is, who is the uh, Métis, who are Métis within the Métis Nation of Alberta. Um, and we can, we can easily do that. We, our intention all along is that we represent citizens of the Métis Nation of Alberta. She says they are working on improving relationships with the settlements. We, you know, we've met um, with um, Dave and Brenda from Métis Settlement General Council. Uh, we are working on a memorandum of understanding. Fort Mackay Métis Nation issued a statement earlier saying the Métis Nation of Alberta is not our government, does not represent us, and the court agrees. It goes on to say, we trust that the federal government will work directly with us and other Métis communities in terms of Section 35 representation. A spokesperson for Crown Indigenous Relations sent a statement saying the Government of Canada will continue working with all the Métis partners to advance their version of self-determination, promote reconciliation, and build renewed government-to-government -government relationships. We are currently reviewing the recently released decision. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. We want to hear what you think about the continued push towards Métis self-government in Alberta or any other stories you see here tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. We need to, we need to step aside for a short break. When we come back... We'll tell you about a mother who wants to raise awareness about the cultural importance of braids after a troubling experience. And I asked her, I was like, so is this an apology just to delete the post or are you guys really sorry for how you made my son feel and my family?
Welcome back to APTN National News. A Niska mother and her son had a troubling experience in a British Columbia restaurant on his birthday. Now they want to raise awareness about the cultural importance of braids to Indigenous people. APTN's Lee Wilson has the story. Keegan is a Niska, Gitzan, and a Heisla boy. He recently celebrated his sixth birthday. Keegan wears long braids, something his parents chose to honor their ancestors and family who attended residential school. His mother, Sheree Alexander, allowed him to pick a fun activity for his birthday. He wanted ice cream. It was at Dairy Queen in Kitimat in Northern BC, where she says their day took an unexpected turn after interactions with staff after Keegan made his order. And then she kind of giggles and she goes, well, what did she want to order? And I said, he, my son would like to order an ice cream cone, one plain cone. And she googles and she looks back like that to her coworkers. And then she says it again. Alexander says her frustration grew as DQ staff continued to mischaracterize Keegan, even after being corrected several times. And it broke my heart and I wanted to like get angry and upset, but I kept my composure because I thought maybe she didn't understand. And then the third time it was just being rude. <laughs> Alexander created a social media post about her experience and filed a complaint against the restaurant through email. She said she was not satisfied with the franchise manager's initial response. We would like you to come in for, uh, so we can apologize. You, you can have lunch on us, but you need to delete your post all in one breath. And I, and I asked, I was like, so is this an apology just to delete the post or are you guys really sorry for how you made my son feel and my family? AP10 News contacted Dairy Queen Canada. They in turn contacted the franchise owners who then provided a statement about the incident. Upon learning of the incident, we immediately contacted the customer and together with Dairy Queen Corporate, apologized and are working to make things right. We're also implementing training for our employees to ensure our restaurant exemplifies the respect and appreciation we have for all people and cultures. Keegan's family hopes businesses across Turtle Island can take their bad experience as one to learn from. They are hopeful training and awareness can make a difference. I think like everybody should be aware that First Nations boys do wear braids. And it's not only the young boys, it's the young men and the older generation that all wear braids now. And it's so beautiful to see everyone joining together like that. Snotty Nose Res Kids, the Heisla rap duo, supported Keegan. They created a social media post on why they proudly wear their braids. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Kitimat. April 19th, 2023, Darnell Finday was walking home when he was struck by a drunk driver, leaving him in need of round-the-clock care. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations is supporting the Finday family. Finday is currently at Park Ridge Center Long-Term Care Home in Saskatoon, away from his family in Mosquito Grizzly Bears Head Lean Man First Nation. He's now unable to walk or talk and needs 24-7 care. The driver who hit Fine Day was sentenced to two years less a day of house arrest and ordered to pay a $200 fine. There was no jail time. Darnell's mother Charlene and the FSIN are calling for harsher sentences for impale, impaired driving, especially when someone is injured or killed. I don't ever want to see another mother go through what I've been through. It's very, very hard and I'm still learning how to um, deal with this. A documentary film on the Wet'suwet'en Nation's fight for sovereignty is set to make its Canadian debut. Yinta, meaning land, is a feature-length documentary spanning more than a decade of the Wet'suwet'en people reoccupying their territory and resisting the construction of pipelines. The film, which follows Molly Wickham and Frida Hewson and their allies, will run during this year's Hot Dogs Festival in Toronto. Wickham and Hewson, join me now. Molly, Frida, thanks for being with us today. Molly, um, let's start with you. So as we mentioned, this documentary spans more than a decade. Can you tell us about it? 
So this documentary attempts to show the Wet'suwet'en struggle for the last decade. Um, Frida and I were both a lot younger and uh, it shows uh, the development of the resistance, not only to the pipeline, but the reoccupation of the territory um, and how that's based in our laws, in our laws and our responsibilities to protect the lands and the waters. Frida, our viewers will be familiar with a lot of the aspects of this resistance over the years. What will people find surprising in the documentary? Mm, what would they find surprising? I don't think anything is surprising because since contact, we've always been battling for our lands and trying to protect what we have for our future generations. And Molly, why is it important for non-Indigenous people to watch this documentary? I think it's important for people to understand that this isn't just about a pipeline. This is a, a, an issue that affects all people, all Canadians, all of society. Um, this is about the destruction of the environment and Indigenous people as stewards of the territory um, and the and the problems that have come since colonization that continue to affect Indigenous people. So this is going to affect everybody, and I think that everybody needs to know what the actual issues are. And this is grounded in our way of knowing and in the way that we wanted to tell the story as Wet'suwet'en people um, so that things don't get missed that are very important to understand when you're looking at an issue like this. And lastly, to Frida, not all Wet'suwet'en are opposed to these projects. Are their views represented? I think a majority of the people are opposed to what's going on, and a very small fraction were for the projects, basically for work, which I don't blame them for. Okay, well, we'll have to leave it there, but Molly, Frida, thank you both so much for your time today, and looking forward to seeing the full documentary. Thank you. Thank you. We need to take one more quick break. Our photo of the day and weather are next. Plus, an art exhibit is featuring some of the top Indigenous tattoo artists from around the world. When I think about our ancestral tattoo practices is that it is a celebration of the generations that came before us. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Spring in the prairies has provided Dave Menzies the opportunity to get this photo of some migrating tundra swans as they pass through southern Manitoba. Thanks for sharing that photo, Dave. Be sure to send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Over on the East Coast, 10 degrees in rain for Halifax, Charlottetown, plus 9. Nain Sunshine and plus 4, Happy Valley Goose Bay, 10 degrees. St. Gilvite, rainy and 16 degrees, Val d'Or, plus 15. Rainy and 17 degrees for Sarnia and Peterborough. 17 in rain for Capus Casing as well, plus 14 in Wawa. Churchill, minus 2 in snow, the Paw, sunshine, 10 degrees. Barron's River, mix of sun and clouds, 6 degrees there. Winnipeg, plus 14. Regina, sunshine and 12 degrees. North Battleford and Saskatoon as well. Stony Rapids, rainy and plus 1. La Ronge, plus 7 and sun. 11 degrees for Peace River, sunshine and plus 12 for Fort McMurray. Red Deer, sunshine and 12 degrees. Rainy and plus 16 for Lethbridge. Vancouver, rainy and 9 degrees. Canal, plus 11 in rain. Fort Nelson, rainy and 10 degrees, Prince Rupert, plus 7. Sunshine and 8 degrees for Mayo, plus 7 in Watson Lake. 8 degrees in sun for Wrigley, Trout Lake, plus 12. Polituck, 0 degrees there, Tuktoyaktuk, sunshine and 2 degrees. Baker Lake, sunny and minus 8, now yet, minus 13. Arctic Bay, snowy and minus 11 there, Iqaluit, minus 2. An 
art exhibit has just opened in Vancouver, featuring some of the top Indigenous tattoo artists from around the world. ABTN's Tina House went down to check things out. The bow of a canoe, they represent a snake pattern. They represent uh, the entryway to our pit houses, our ceremony houses. And so ultimately the design is like transformation and ceremony. A new exhibit at the Vancouver Museum called True Tribal, Contemporary Expressions of Ancestral Tattoo Practices, has just opened and is the first of its kind to celebrate traditional tattooing from around the world. And tonight, some of the best tattoo artists have traveled to Vancouver to showcase this ancient art form. Dion Cassis is a co-curator of the exhibit. When I think about our ancestral tattoo practices is that it is a celebration of the generations that came before us. You know, it's a celebration and an embodiment of the resilience of those who prayed, struggled, fought, and cried us into existence. And so really it is that celebration of our ancestors who ensured that we are here today. So Cassis really is also one up. of the three artists in Western North America to revive this ancient form of tattooing in 2009. This mural showcases some of his work, featuring Echo Alec that has been tattooed by Dion, reflecting her connection to her culture. When I first walked in the room earlier, I walked in with the photographer who took the picture actually. And I just, I just grabbed her and I could feel the tears welling. Um, it's just wildly surreal to witness the journey. Uh, it was an immense healing journey and to see it that big. <laughs> um, and as a part of this incredible, incredible exhibition, I'm just I'm overwhelmed with love, with gratitude, with uh, absolute fierce admiration for Dion, for Tunasa, um, for everyone who has been a part of the journey. Julie Paama Pengeli is Maori and a world-renowned tattoo artist from New Zealand. She is one of the artists featured in the exhibit. She says practicing this ancient art form is an honor. This is about legacy, this is about ongoing connection to our ancestors and our world. And so I think everybody actually Indigenous who is into skin marking understands that the most powerful connector to our world comes through our skin marking. Our tattoo designs are on baskets. They're painted on the rocks in your territory. They're embellishing your ancestral regalia. Those are the clues and the footprints that you need to follow to revive your ancestral uh, traditions. Tina House, ABT National News, Vancouver. And that's all the time we have for your midweek news. For news anytime, visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Savannah Kelly, Marcy Miigwich. Thank you for joining us. Take care and have a great night.